James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States, served two terms from 1817 until 1825. He would be the last of what was called the Virginia Dynasty. Dynasty has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Winning the 1816 election was the pinnacle of my long, storied career. I mean, what more do you expect out of a man? Monroe proved himself to be a key player in the political establishment. He was supported for a long time by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. He was elected as the fifth president in the 1816 elections after beating the Federalist candidate, Rufus King. We fully supported you, James. We just couldn't support anyone named Rufus. Besides, does the Federalist Party even exist anymore? The Democratic Republicans go for the three-peat. James, you really stepped up and made me look good by that Louisiana Purchase deal. We never did celebrate Mardi Gras in New Orleans. The White House looks pretty good after the fires. Now that I've been elected president, I don't think some of the Northerners are particularly happy with yet another president from Virginia. I think I should go visit, make sure they know I'm here for all Americans, you know, to spread some good feelings. Thanks for selecting me to be Secretary of State, Mr. President. I was tired of being the minister to Britain. On Sunday, June 1, 1817, just three months after his inauguration, is the fifth president, 59-year-old James Monroe, and a small entourage embarked on a tour of the northern states with two critical goals, inspection of military defenses and national unity. Many Northerners who were predominantly Federalists were still upset about the War of 1812, so Monroe used this opportunity to stress national unity. Thanks for stopping by, James. I heard the Colombian Centennial newspaper is calling this tour and your presidency the era of good feelings. You're off to a tremendous start. The era of good feelings represented a period after the War of 1812 where Americans didn't have to focus on disputes and wars in Europe as well as home. The era also proved to be a temporary lull in personal and political leadership clashes as the Federalists were significantly weakened. Well, I have a great reputation to honor and defend, so I'll be on my way to tour the South, too. Farewell, Boston. There of good feelings amassed a number of growing problems in the country. Slavery became a hotly disputed political issue when Missouri sought to enter the Union as a state. Another emerging issue during the Monroe administration was the first great financial depression of the 19th century, the Panic of 1819. This was caused by inflationary practices by the newly created Second Bank of the United States and the economic slowdown due to the slump in exports during the War of 1812. It's a shame that it had to come to war again with the Brits in 1812, but they just kept harassing our ships. Glad that you were my Secretary of War. The country definitely felt the economic changes after the war, but I did my best to unify and focus my efforts on expanding the United States by acquiring Florida from Spain for $5 million. In 1817, Missouri applied for statehood. The saga became known as the Missouri Compromise because at the time there were 11 pro-slavery and 11 anti-slavery states. Missouri wanted to be a slave-owning state, thus tipping the political scales in the Senate. Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, would draw up a plan whereby Missouri would be admitted alongside Maine, an anti-slavery state, thus maintaining the balance in the Senate. It was also agreed that going forward, any states admitted north of the Missouri southern border would be free of slavery. With the Missouri Compromise signed, I could now focus on my re-election. As luck would have it, I ran unopposed by the Federalists in 1820. Guess they saw I had a good thing going, and I won every state received all but one of the electoral votes. After the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, many colonies belonging to Spain and Portugal in Latin America revolted and declared their independence. The European powers were not looking to give up quietly. President Monroe had a decision to make about the future of the Americas and national security of the country. I must make a decision that ensures that imperialist powers from overseas can see that not only is the United States not for sale or open to any more colonization, but our brothers in South America are off limits too. Well, do whatever you can to avoid another war, Mr. President. I don't think the last one was too popular. You've done an awful lot to appease and unify the country, and we don't want to see that go down the drain. You're right, James. I'm very proud of the Monroe Doctrine. That's a nice ring to it. 
I have to give credit to my Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, for playing a major role in drafting the Monroe Doctrine. Well, John, you and I have done it. We have written a document that lets the Europeans know that the Americas are off limits and to know that the United States is becoming a global superpower. We concluded that the Russians in the West, with their fur trade and most of the European powers, all had plans to colonize the Americas for their own gain. This document stops them in their tracks. The Monroe Doctrine would be read to Congress on December 2nd, 1823, solidifying the United States' presence in the world and establishing a new type of global foreign policy. While I must admit, I had enormous challenges during my presidency, but I'm ready to hand off the bat. John Quincy, I hope you want to run in 1824. Monroe would be responsible for ushering in the era of good feelings, a term coined during his administration, and he would pen a significant document called the Monroe Doctrine that would shape American foreign policy for many years to come. All good things have to come to an end. And now, I'm ready to retire with my wife Elizabeth after two terms to our state, Oak Hill in Virginia. Good luck, John Quincy.